Okay, good evening and good afternoon and good morning for those of you who are joining us from the West Coast. We have over 100 people signed up for today's uh, meeting, so we're going to continue to let them in, but we want to be respectful of your time and our tight schedule, and we want to make sure we have uh, enough time to cover everything that we have planned, so we'll begin the program. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sigal Yaniv Feller. I'm Deputy Director at JFN Israel. Uh, but before that, I've been a lifelong environmentalist many, many years, both in the philanthropic community and the environmental community in Israel. And at JFN, we encourage peer interest groups where groups of funders come together around mutual fields of interest. The Green Funders Forum, the forum that you've joined today, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a, our largest peer network at JFN, and it provides knowledge, tools, and uh, networking to help funders come together and strategically address Israel's pressing environmental issues. Just to be clear, it's a non-solicitation space, it's a safe space and we treat it as such and we only let members of the philanthropic community join. But it's not exclusively for JFN members, it's open to anyone from the philanthropic community. The Green Funders Forum is a resource for fellow funders, no matter what your funding areas are, it's a place to come and learn about the issues and to also learn how to act in case you wanna act. I believe we're all here tonight for a reason, or today for those of you who it's still morning where you're at. And I don't only mean the reason being Marla and Marla calling you, which is a great source and power source bringing many of you up to this call. Um, you might be here because your children are asking you what you're doing about it, or because the fact none of us can ignore climate change anymore. We're watching the news, we're seeing what's going on around the world and in Israel, and the world is changing. And I think many of us are wondering what we're gonna leave behind us and what we could do about it. And I, I think we, we all understand that now is the time to do something about it. Um, so this is really the reason behind today's session. We can't run these groups without energy. In our case, we have environmentally friendly energy and that's Marla Stein. She's really the live spirit who co-chairs the Green Funder Forum with me. And she's been leading this important effort. So Marla, I really can't thank you enough um, for your partnership with the Green Funders Forum. And thanks to funders like you, it's what makes the issue constantly be on the table and on the agenda for us and for many other funders who care about it. And I'm handing it over to you. Thanks, Sigal. And by the way, it is just amazing that you are so personally committed to this issue. Many thanks also to Gil Yaakov, maybe raise your hand, who is the consultant to the Green Funders Forum. And really we are a team we could not, we work together so well and it's really a blessing. I am Marla, Marla Stein, and I'm the co-chair of the Green Funders Forum, which is the address for people funding in the environment or who are interested in learning more. The growing climate emergency presents a serious risk to the pursuit of all philanthropic aims. All aspects of society will be affected and all aspects of our philanthropy will be affected. We have no time to lose. We, with less than 10 years to act, all funders, whatever your mission, field of expertise, have an immense potential for positive impact. It's time to plan our role as individual philanthropists and collectively. This is particularly timely as the world countries are coming together in less than two weeks to tackle climate change in the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Glasgow. So we at the Green Funders Forum decided to devise a five-part series to get members of the philanthropic community up to speed on the core principles, challenges, and opportunities to make a difference. In the coming session, sessions, we will cover how the climate crisis intersects with other topics. We'll give you examples of what's happening on the ground and we'll discuss tachlis game changers where, where philanthropy can make a difference. We'll be delighted if you can attend all five sessions, but each session will be standalone in its own right. The next session will be right after Glasgow on November 16th and we'll focus on the intersection of climate change with other funding priorities. Be sure to register for that session as well. We are putting the registration link in the chat. In addition to learning opportunities in the sessions, participants are eligible for a free consultation meeting to explore personal philanthropic strategies around this issue. We will also share resources for funders following each session. With that, we are honored to host member of Knesset, Professor Alon Tal, followed by Minister Tamar Zamberg, the new Minister of Environmental Protection. In this session, we will share an overview on key terms and facts, updated information, opportunities, and the urgency for Jewish philanthropy to act. We will give time for Q&A following each speaker. Please note your questions in the chat. 
And now I'm honored to present member of Knesset, Professor Alon Tal. And I have to say, having known Alon for many years, I'm so emotional even just saying member of Knesset, it's so exciting. Alon is the past chair of the Public Policy School at Tel Aviv University. He is one of Israel's leading environmental voices. He has founded some of the most important organizations in Israel's environment, including the leading advocacy organization, Adam Tebavadin, the Arava Institute, which is dedicated to collaboration between Israel, the PA, and Jordan, and most recently, the organization Safuf, the Israel Forum for Demography, Environment, and Society. Alone has published and edited 11 books and over 100 academic articles about Israel's environment. His forthcoming book is called Environment, Climate, and National Security, A New Angle for Israel. Alone was the recipient of the prestigious Charles Bronfman Prize and his and Lisa's own philanthropic fund, the Tall Fund. Welcome, Alon. Thanks so much, Marla. And again, a big salute to Gil Yaakov and Sigal for bringing this forum together. It is really, really uh, gratifying to see so many people in the Jewish world who uh, realize that we as a community need to be part of this issue. And certainly in these days, for those of us who go to synagogue or just follow the, the, the Torah readings, you know, two weeks after we read about uh, Noah and the ark and the, the covenant that God makes after the flood and says, We're, I'm not going to destroy your planet anymore. And it's pretty clear to me that God's kept his side of the bargain. It's not so clear that, clear that we are. And then just now that we're into the stories of Abraham, who really brought the issue of carrying capacity and what happens to a system when you over uh, exceed your capacity. These are issues which are really fundamental to Judaism. And now uh, our Jewish values and environmental values kind of converge as we try to deal with this. There's lots of people on the call that uh, know much about uh, climate change. I was asked to give an introductory uh, presentation. I think what I'll probably end up doing is say a few conduct, uh, introductory things and then sort of assume that everybody's ready for a more advanced seminar and give you some of my thoughts on this issue. So um, I'm calling this particular uh, presentation, you'll give me a second to get organized here. Um, Israel's response to climate change, 10 points that are germane for philanthropy. But I want to start with just a few basic concepts because I understand that not everybody is in the same place. When I think about the global warming, I think about a down comforter. I think about the fact that when I'm cold on a, uh, an unheated house or in a cabin and I throw a blanket on, it warms me up. When I throw a second blanket up, more heat is captured. And as I get uh, the third blanket on, things start to feel a little bit better. And that is the, no the, the, the nature of greenhouse gases. The more we put out there in the atmosphere, the more heat is trapped. And uh, without greenhouse gases, of course, the planet would be almost uninhabitable, it would be freezing. But the fact that we have over the past 100 years, certainly since the Industrial Revolution, uh, been increasingly um, re releasing to the environment carbon stocks, which have been in the earth for so long, have created a thicker blanket that existed. And of course, they're not talking about very large quantities to change the balance, but we know that these are the hottest years in the recorded history of the planet, and it is having remarkable effects. Climate change affects all aspects uh, of life, certainly the physical environment, from the, the way the coasts look to the way the, the forests are, the animal communities that aren't always able to adapt as quickly as they might, the, the droughts and the, and the like. I wanted to say one more thing that one of the critical things to remember is that climate change is a lot, a lot, a lot of public policy challenges. We have a tendency perhaps to distill it down to the importance of renewable energy. And yes, renewable energy in general in Israel, particular solar is critical. But in a global context, that's less than 30% of, uh, of the actual uh, emissions, around 30%. And we have all the rest of the 70%. In Israel, maybe 40% of our emissions come from electricity. But when we think about other areas, just the, the meat on our plates or the, the garbage, and the way we dispose of it, and the way we travel, these all matter a great deal. To make the point clear, in Israel, one factory, the Ramla Nesher, uh, cement plant produces 6% of our emissions. If we don't figure out how to make a cement cleaner, we're not going to be able to succeed. So it's a, it's a host of challenges. I want to share with you sort of 10 quick ideas that I have that uh, might be of interest to you. The first of all, let's remember this is a regional issue, that the region is considered to be a hotspot 
uh, literally and figuratively for climate change. We see unbelievably hot uh, temperatures, and that's the reason why we put out this book about um, security. Anybody who looks at what happened in Syria knows that it was five years of consecutive drought that produced the uh, collapse of agriculture, which uh, basically was the turbulence that created the instability and the tragedy there. So we cannot divorce ourselves from the issue. And we see all over the region record temperatures coming on uh, line 50 degrees and up. Basically, in many towns, except places in Cairo or Baghdad, if you don't have an air conditioner, that is the difference between life and death. Old people are not always able to get out of their places. In Israel, we joined the 50 degree company for, uh, club for the first time, even in Israel. And I'm talking 50 degrees. Uh, maybe somebody can give me a thing. I think we're talking about 130 degrees. These are the kind of things that we see at the peak temperatures of Death Valley for the American. Uh, it's amongst so it's really, really, really hot when we see these kind of temperatures. And the scary thing, of course, is that it's just going to get hotter. Uh, at a day-to-day -day level, we see changes in Israel. Uh, so that I always tell uh, my students that climate change is no longer the dreary projections of Al Gore. It is our new uh, weather patterns. Uh, we have seen a uh, basically a two-degree increase over the last. 40 years with I, I, know. I know it's good to hear young voices because they're, they're the ones who are going to suffer the, the hot temperatures. But just realize that our temperature increases in Israel are twice the global averages. Our sea rise is more than twice the average uh, of the world. So everything that you read about that could happen is already happening in Israel. And I'm talking about the flooding that we see in our cities during the rainy seasons, which are uh, here they are coming. Um, frequency of fires. We had a massive fire in Jerusalem, but it wasn't even as big as the big one we had the year before that in, in Nazareth. It's uh, partly due to a national raised arson, but the impact is so big because it's so dry. So we know that in the region, uh, there is a water shortage and places like Jordan are being pushed so hard that water has become a destabilizing issue. Israel has an interest because of the new drought patterns to provide water. We know that the Dead Sea is disappearing, partly because of the uh, diversions, but basically because the Kinneret, the Lake uh, of the Sea of Galilee, which consistently provided water to the Jordan River, can no longer do it because the water and precipitation has dropped so quickly. And here you can see sort of the average drop, but this is what we're looking at in terms of the trends here. Look at the um, tributaries to the Jordan River those that supply our Kinneret, our historic uh, reservoir. And you can see that the, the numbers are dropping. This is just, you don't have to be a genius to see that. And the fact that the Kinneret recorded its lowest level in histo recorded history not long ago. So we've had two good years of rain, but still salinity increases because as you know, more heat, more evaporation, less water. So that the this was one of Israel's major successes in ecological restoration, the Kinneret. I'm very concerned if these numbers continue to climb that the fish stock there will not survive. And that brings me to the third point that the technology uh, that this is, although a challenge, it's something to be worried about from Israel's perspective. And I think the world's perspective, it is a technological opportunity. This is a picture of a desalination plant. One example of a, a technology which could help us adapt to climate change and we make the distinction between adaptation, assuming that the temperatures will rise and we're gonna to try to at least try to adapt that way, but as opposed to mitigation. So here it's a, but if we don't get the, electricity clean, we are going to be creating more of a problem than we want to. Israel, as many of you know, has produced five uh, major desalination plants so that we've managed to reduce the concerns about domestic drinking water. But uh, it also gives us a chance to share some of this water with Jordan. So when we think about the, the agenda, we need, I think, especially with the renewed uh, cooperation and the new atmosphere in the region with our government, um, we can uh, talk about that. And we know that the uh, ability to save the uh, Red Sea requires a, a, the Dead Sea requires a regional effort. Maybe it's going to be in the Red Dead Canal, which is to produce clean uh, electricity and bring water to Jordan as well as that. Um, and I just want to make one point that uh, I, it's not usually my job as a blue and white member of Knesset to say nice things about the Likud, who's in the opposition. But before he uh, moved to the opposition, the Minister of Energy, Dr. Yuval Stein, said something very, very bold, and I think we should recognize it. To me, it was the biggest adaptation uh, project in the Middle East, where for the first time, we've cre we're creating an infrastructure which can take water from the Mediterranean and deliver it to the Kinneret. So all the years that the Kinneret was part of the, the source of the national water carrier, 
and now all of a sudden it doesn't have water to share, we're going to bring more water to the Kinneret, and maybe that will provide uh, Jordan with the water it needs. We have other uh, technological innovations that you think are uh, germane. Uh, certainly uh, the way we plant trees is unique. Carbon sequestration is going to be critical. We need to get uh, these ideas and, and, and uh, methodologies for tree planting in dry lands to the Sahel where we have massive deforestation and desertification. And uh, the most recent one is this notion of what we call agrovoltaic production. How can we make solar electricity on open spaces that are agricultural without compromising our yields. There may be some ways we can do this creatively, which will be a boom for both. So these are the kind of things that are happening in Israel, and I'm hoping we can make that. Now, you're going to get to hear directly, but I'll try to make a shout out for our new Minister of Environment, who has just been terrific on this issue. And she doesn't come from my party, but I have uh, nothing but respect for Tamar Zomberg, who really pushed the government to adopt uh, tough climate goals. And you can see uh, that by 2050, this government is looking to reduce our greenhouse ga uh, gas emissions by some 85%. And that's very good news. The less good news is by 2030, the, the objectives are far, far smaller. So for example, if Joe Biden has promised that by 2035, America will have 100% renewables, sadly in Israel, uh, we're only talking about 30%. And I believe we could be pushed more. And it's the Israeli, I'll talk in a minute about these Israeli civil society, which is pushing us and actually writing the climate uh, change law, which uh, Minister Zandberg, I think, will be able to uh, shepherd through the government. But it was the civil society, which was supported largely by philanthropy. Many of the people in this room, in this chat have that. Um, but like I said, it's also emerging as an, a local issue in, in Israel, where municipalities are really realizing they can't uh, not be part of the solution, certainly in adaptation. We have major problems with drainage. We have uh, all kinds of issues with uh, set, trying to set standards for shading as Israel gets hotter. And uh, for those people who are interested in supporting local grassroots initiative, there is so much to be done in the climate sector. And indeed, we saw certainly in the US during the years when the federal government was not playing the game, either if it was the Bush years or the, the Trump years, how cities stepped up and an Israeli city sort of took an ex example of that. And we'd be very impressed, both in terms of green building standards and um, encouraging renewable energy. This particular just an example, Nofa Galil, formerly Nazareth Elite, has now producing so much energy off the roofs of its public buildings that it doesn't pay electricity bills anymore. So these are the kind of uh, innovations that we need to have if we're going to move forward as, as a group. Now, it would be, um, I think, disingenuous for me to talk about the issue of climate change without talking about the role of population. Globally, you can see it's a pretty clear issue. If the world's population is still two, three billion people, we would not have a climate crisis. But as the population increases, so do the emissions. Every child born is born with the right to have a carbon footprint, a water footprint. But as the world pushes forward towards a population of an eight and nine, and eventually, who knows, 12, 13 billion people, we're going to be in trouble. And when uh, scientists at the University of British Columbia did such an important study to look at what can individuals do to reduce their carbon footprint, they said a lot of things are important, and we all know what they are there. You know, uh, don't use your uh, clothes dryer and eat a plant-based diet and get rid of your car. But more than anything else, almost 50 times more was their conclusion to have one fewer child. And that's something which we don't like to talk about in Israel and in the Jewish world because it's sensitive and we're post-Holocaust, but we have to talk about it. You can see what's happened on the planet. Why is it that the OECD emissions for greenhouse gases, the warm of the earth is dropping, but the non-OECD, the developing countries are going up. It used to be that rich countries produced 75% of the greenhouse gases. Now it's shifting and that is all about population. Jordan is an example. They're up now in the close to 11 million people and here's their emissions just like that. Egypt, 2 million, million people every year and they also are having massive increases. And Israel um, is, the, is, the, is not the champion in the region, but we went from uh, basically one to, to uh, 9 million people in, in uh, 70 years. And our carbon is, is extremely high, and it's because of our high birth rate. So those are issues we don't usually talk about, but I think if we're thinking systemically, if Israel continues to double in size, it'll be hard to meet our goals. The good news is, is that civil society is waking up and the youth of our country are leading the way. Here is a uh, sit in sleep and whatever by the youth for the climate strain. And I think, Marla, you've had some of the representatives on uh, JFN discussions, but every time I meet these uh, high school students who incidentally are well represented in both the Jewish and the Arab sector, it gives me hope 
and they uh, roam the Knesset halls and grab us and are constantly holding our feet to the fire and saying, don't forget us and don't compromise because at the end of the day, uh, when we put emissions in the atmosphere, they're going to be there for two or 300 years. We have to think about this as an intergenerational justice issue. This uh, next Friday, we're going to have once again our national climate march. We had two years of cancellations due to the COVID crisis. I hope it'll be a record number of people. And uh, and uh, this is an, a really important initiative. I know that our, our foundation supported it for several years, including this one, because we really believe this is a way to bring people together. And on this issue, I'm so happy. I just want to shout out to my colleagues in the Knesset. This was the first meeting of what we call the Green Legislator Group. Every single faction of every party in the coalition, you've got here Mosi Raz from Meretz, and you've got uh, Ron from Labor, and all of my colleagues, I don't want to go to them. Each one of these are environmental champions. And so when I got to the Knesset, I found there are lots of partners and there is a whole lot of laws on the table and support for it. And so I, I think that this is what we call sort of a, a perfect storm, as we say, uh, in terms of our ability to change the reality. Um, recently, Israeli young people, this is a college student, Michal Deutsch, uh, hunger striking. These uh, young Israelis take it seriously and are forcing old timers like me to, to realize that maybe we need to really realize that this is a crisis. And indeed, I expect the government will declare it one soon. Um, um, so one other matter that I want to say is that we cannot, in Israel, deny the fact that there is a new president who takes climate change extremely seriously, who is leading the way. Um, I'm trying, by the way, if anybody has a connection to John Kerry, we're having the big Knesset event uh, in uh, here. I'm, I'm over organizing for next uh, Tuesday. All Israeli uh, participants and those who can get over here are invited to join us in the big auditorium. We would love to have a two minute talk from uh, John Kerry because uh, the fact that uh, Prime Minister Bennett takes this issue so seriously, I think is because he does care about the environment, but he also cares about relations with the US and the US administration is holding the world community's feet to the fire and expecting us to do better. Um, and the other point I really wanted to make on this issue is that philanthropy matters. And here I gave, you know, from environmental education to uh, uh, efforts in the Supreme Court to litigate progress and, and, and push the government to meet its needs. And here's local city councils. The civil society in Israel has been, uh, I think, an increasingly uh, vociferous force demanding change. And slowly but surely, it is starting to uh, take hold. And that would not have happened without the support of many uh, of the of the foundations and funds that are attending this and out of there. And, and those of you who have been involved, I want you to know that your money was very well spent. It is the best investment in uh, our children's future, in the, in the Jewish state's contribution to this global challenge. Um, so uh, there is an increasingly, uh, I would, like I said, willingness to, to, to speak out and we are, are doing that. So the final point is, is that I tend to be an incurable uh, optimist. And when I think about the climate change, both in terms of those of you who are coming in from around the world or in Israel, I think this is something which we can solve. And we can solve it because almost all the technologies we need are already here. And what we need is a whole lot more political will. I'm trying to do what I can here in the Knesset. Um, but certainly, uh, it is much easier to operate when there is an ecosystem out there of environmental organizations, and I'm talking not only about uh, Israeli environmental organizations, but the wonderful Jewish environmental organizations, organizations like uh, Chazon, and, and um, the, the, everybody's involved in every synagogue, and every Jewish organization should be part of the solution, because it's too big for any single institution to take it on. We all need to be partners, and like I say, it's a it's not a spectator sport. We need players. By you guys coming to today's discussion, you are players, and I'm grateful for that. I think I'm just inside my 20 minutes or 19, and so we have time for questions. Thank you very much. Alon, thank you. That was exactly your time frame, and you did an excellent job in conveying. I think it was like an annual course that you just were able to condense <laughs> into, uh, into like 20 minutes. So what, uh, what we'd like to do now is Anyone who would like to ask questions from alone, please note them in the chat. Um, Jennifer, I see you're raising the hand, but it would be easier if you put the questions in the chat so we can manage the different questions from the different participants, because there are many, many of you out here, and, uh, and we'll be able to read out the questions to alone. 
Uh, maybe until we see the first questions popping up alone, I'll pose the first question. Oh, here we go. Jennifer already put one. What is being done to work with China on these issues? Beats me. I mean, we know <laughs> that almost all the panels, the solar panels on Israeli roof, are, roofs are made in China. And when there were supply issues, uh, it did slow us down a little bit. Um, China, as many of you know, is increasingly involved in the Israeli economy. They just built a new port in Haifa. There was a, they bought the, the, the leading Israeli dairy, Chinese investors. So there is some concern that maybe we are becoming too dependent. On the other hand, uh, China produces more renewable energy than any place else in the world. And uh, they have uh, technological abilities that I think would be foolish to ignore. But I don't know of any specific diplomatic issue which, which uh, highlights climate. I'm unaware of that. Okay, thank you. Another question, as someone who grew up in the, in the civil society and who actually raised many of the environmental organizations in Israel and now working from within the, cap the Israeli capital hill, the Knesset, what are the things that you see from there that you didn't see from here? Well, the first thing I realize is that uh, when people complain about the Israeli bureaucracy, and it seems like a, just a, you know, it's sort of like an excuse, it's very real. I just had my first uh, law go through a preliminary reading, and it's a little law about, you know, reporting about biodiversity, and six different government ministries objected to it. No, they were in favor of the law, but you want to do a monitoring of the sea. Well, that's us at the Ministry of Energy. Well, you want to have the cities involved, but that's us at the Ministry of Interior. So it's very, very hard to get things done, certainly as an individual um, legislator. The difference is, is that uh, we have a very unique political situation. For those of you who aren't aware, uh, we have a very razor thin majority, 61 to 59, actually 60, 59, put this government in place. And as we say in Israel, I'll say that every bastard is a king. In other words, a member of Knesset could bring down the government tomorrow if he falls asleep and doesn't go to a vote. So he could also bring the government if he doesn't get what he wants in terms of climate legislation. So hopefully all everybody will use this unbelievable power responsibly. But I think that's something I didn't realize that in this particular unique opportunities, we could push the government on these kind of issues more than we could. And it's not just one member of Knesset. Like I said, there is a, a remarkable uh, team of green legislators from every party. Great, thank you. Um, another question, you've touched it a little bit, but tell me if you, now that you have a few more minutes to elaborate about the role that you see for both civil society and for philanthropy backing up civil society and where does the role of civil society end and the role of the government begin in your eyes? Well, uh, we unfortunately have a situation where in the past several functions of the government which were not filled, were filled in by Israeli civil society. It started in the 1950s when we didn't have any nature can, uh, rangers. So the Society Protection of Nature in Israel, the oldest and largest and fantastic uh, environmental group, sent people without real authority out into the field to sort of monitor protection of nature. And, and there has been the sense that, well, we'll let them do it. It's certainly the true in Israel in terms of the way we deal with our food uh, and, and security issues and the like. So um, I would like to see civil society, which does things which the civil society does best. First of all, education. We need to have a transformation in so many ways, the way people look at the world, in the way uh, I mentioned the, the, the diet. The, the, there's so much ways we, we need to start uh, taking kids at a young age and telling them, no, it's not OK to eat meat four or five times a week. Israel's number one in the world in chicken, which is a little better than beef, but not a whole lot. We need to, to really uh, change those kind of issues to uh, really uh, not only push decision makers to make more public transportation but get on the bus or the train and leave the cars at home. And, and I think that there's a lot that civil society can do that. And at the same time, civil society is extremely apt in Israel. We don't call it lobbying because then we would get into all kinds of trouble with the uh, tax exempt status in the US. But I'm educated constantly by representatives of civil society organizations across the board. From, from animal rights to the large environmental groups to the Parents for the Climate Change, a wonderful new organization, Children for the Climate Change. And, and not just my doors are open, I see them, uh, Israeli legislatures, because you are so overwhelmed with uh, so many issues, you need the help of these experts who come with very practical solutions and how do you correct this law so that it doesn't cause damage. So I, I would say that, that these are areas where civil society has been hugely successful. And finally, we know 
that although we now have a government which is extremely attuned to the environment, there may be a change in the future at some point, at which point the courts will be very, very important. Creating environmental standards have proven to be uh, something which matters because Israeli courts will enforce them. And that's another area. And the final thing I want to see, because I see a friend on the screen who is uh, the chair of the, um, the council for for, uh, which deals with religion and, and, and environment, there's a lot of spiritual um, dimensions to environmentalism in general and climate change in particular. And I think that civil society is able to bring those message in a digestible way, even to a secular public and explain to people that we need to be in harmony with the earth and that it's not all about how much money you can make and how many uh, you know, cars you can put in your garage or whatever. We have several other questions. I'll try to cover them all. It seems that climate change has to do with all the ministries, yet only the environmental ministry deals with it. Maybe there is place to think of the holistic function, National Center for Climate or such, that will look at policies for each and every one of the ministries rather than throwing it only at the small ministry of environment. So well, translates climate change to each and every one of the ministries. That might be a question also for Tamar Zandberg later. I think it would be. I mean, Tamar will, will say, well, the, the answer is to give me more uh, funding. And I will say in her uh, credit, you can say Aluntal uh, saluted her. She managed to bring 600 million shekels to uh, the issue of climate change, which is more than twice her regular budget. So uh, good, good honor. But I, I uh, would argue that the Ministry of Energy has become a full partner in the issue. Uh, uh, Karina Al-Harar, our Minister of, uh, of Energy, is a remarkable woman. She very quietly, because she's not a, uh, a boisterous, aggressive person, but she managed in her own effective way to bring 2.5 billion shekels to renewable energy and energy efficiency programs in Israel. And that's a, a staggering amount. It's, it's a, a fraction of what we need, but given to what we've had in the past, it's a lot. So I think the Ministry of Energy is moving on. She just made a very, very bold declaration. She will not issue any more gas or oil exploration licenses. That's over. That transition period too is, is and she's only gonna push this. So, so there is there are other partners there that I think are important. I think the Minister of Agriculture, uh, Oded Four, is on board, very concerned about how can he provide uh, better, given the heat, Shading and how can the Ministry of uh, for uh, Agriculture, which is responsible for us, to use the good offices of the JNF? So there are other partners. And that said, whoever asked the question is correct. There needs to be a holistic thing. There needs to be a and, and a, a maybe run out of the Prime Minister's office. And there's a lot of different suggestions. There needs to be some sort of an alter. This like they're doing in the United States, where they have somebody in the White House who makes sure that everybody's on board. Transportation I haven't talked about. Uh, our Minister of Transportation gets it. But again, there needs to be a lot of coordination. Okay, quickly, two more last questions. I think we can fit them both in. Through the Abraham Accord and or BIRD or other US-Israel initiatives, what is being done to advance the science on H2O, energy storage, fusion, or other issues? I don't know of any energy research initiatives which are happening in the Abraham Accords. I understand there have been delegations flying back and forth. There is an expo now at Dubai, and Israel just had a large delegation out there, and I'm sure that there's discussions. I can't point to anything breakthrough. There is also a darker side to our relations with the uh, with the uh, United Emirates, and I don't mind taking a, uh, moving into the um, somewhat more controversial realm. Uh, there is an agreement between a new uh, Dubai-based company called the Red Med Company, which bring wants to bring 70 massive oil tankers of oil from the United Emirates to a lot use our existing infrastructure for oil transfer and bring that to Ashkelon. Right now we have about four or five and a lot of environmentalists are very concerned with, with that amount of oil, 250,000 tons per one it would do, the security concerns. And of course this is a 60 year old pipe which has a habit of leaking. So this is one area where we have to make sure that our cooperation with the United Arab Emirates is, is a positive area. I understand we have one final question and we'll wrap it up. Yep. Um, we have the same issues, climate issues in the U.S. Globally, how would you make the case that Israel can be a model of sustainability for philanthropists in the diaspora? Well, I think that's one thing we would like to be. I'm not sure that we are. There's some areas where Israel gets it right and that we need to, I think I mentioned already, forestry is an area we, we know that, that carbon sequestration needs to be part of the solution. And Israel can plant trees in areas where nobody else can plant trees. That might be an area where Israeli could export some of its experience and, and do well. Uh, already I mentioned the uh, desal as another, another example, but I would challenge all of you that, you know, if, if, if somebody has a issue, they think that they would like to you know, promote, you know, hydrogen. There's hydrogen 
companies in Israel who are doing really interesting things. It's a good investment. It is a growing market. And um, to, to do well, do good by doing well and all those kind of things, I think this is a real opportunity uh, for, for investment. And there are uh, climate-friendly funds. Uh, I guess I should close with that. I'm sure you'll have other discussions about this, Marla, but, but there are ways to make sure that your investments also are helping to promote solutions and not promoting the problems. But once again, I, I'm grateful for everybody who came on here and I see so many people that I haven't been able to recognize, but um, I think if the, the, the Jewish philanthropic community gets involved and helps, um, of course, all global efforts, but certainly a Jewish response, it's something that uh, our grandchildren will thank us for because we have that 10 year, now it's probably more like nine year window of opportunity. And so as Hillel Hazaken and said in the Perkei Avod, if not now, when in Loma, in Loma Matai, we need to move now. And there are, Martin Luther King said, there are times when tomorrow's not today, there is such a thing as being too late. Let's not be too late. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alon. We'll let you go back to your legislative, legislative efforts way into the night. Okay, we're moving on to the second part of the program. In this part also, we're gonna be hosting Minister Tamar Zanberg. Tamar, thank you so much for joining us. And Sigal, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I'll take it from here. Thank you, Tamar. We alone spoke a little bit about you and we're very happy to host you here with the Green Funders Forum and you've got the background about the forum. I'll just briefly mention that you're not only the Minister of Environmental Protection, you're the former chairwoman of the Merits Party, you've been a member of the Knesset for eight years, you're well known for your social and feminist activism and for many years involved in issues of human rights, sustainable planning, urbanism, affordable housing and rent, natural resources, sustainable transportation, religious pluralism and more. You're also a former Tel Aviv um, city council and shared many several Knesset, Knesset um, committees. I'll stop there, but it's much longer because we really wanna hear what you have to say to the philanthropic community who's on the call here with us. Um, I plan to ask you some questions. I'll briefly just put it all in one and let you speak freely, but we generally okay. really wanted to hear, um, first of all, um, why do, if Israel is such a small part of climate change um, of the problem, why do you think Israel as a country needs to address it and it needs to be part of the solution? And why should it be part of the national agenda? What do you personally plan to do about it? And what do you think the government should be doing about it? And maybe finally, where do you see the role of civil society and of philanthropy in relation to, to everything you'll say before that? Mm -hmm. Thank you for organizing this very important uh, um webinar um i, I will i will tackle the, the first question uh, uh, right away because i think uh, many uh, uh, contemplate about that israel is so small such a small uh, uh, effect on the global uh, emissions the global effort and on the other hand such big other problems that probably the philanthropy community is uh, well known with uh, in social politics in in everything so um, first of all, my perception is that um, Israel may be small in size and maybe in, in uh, the portion of the emissions, but um, Israel is part of the, of the international uh, community and wants to be part, is part of the OECD, is a member of the UN. And uh, if we look at where the world is going, um, economy nowadays is not separated from environment. Uh, you know, these are not the days that environment is some kind of an uh, enemy or, or in conflict with economy. If you look at the, uh, the, what is happening in, in the global uh, economies and the markets, environment becomes a huge part and maybe a leading part of what drives and what motivates investors, uh, uh, um, foundations, uh, citizens, by the way, and activists. So um, Israel is part of it. It's part of our international commitments. Uh, it's part of the Paris ag Agreement. Um, it has to contribute its part. And uh, it's true that the large countries like the US, uh, China, India, uh, the European Union um, contribute the bigger part of the uh, emissions, but the small countries summed up together also have their fair share. And uh, the international community expects developed industrial, um, part of the, of the international community countries 
to contribute their share and Israel uh, cannot uh, escape that. And by the way, we hear that also from international leaders. Um, in every forum we attend, we hear the same thing, you know, where are you? Where is Israel? Um, so we have to do it. That's, that's one. Second, um, Israel may be, even if, it, if, even, if, even if we take that notion that Israel is a small part of the contribution to the global emissions, Israel is widely uh, influenced. I mean, the impact of climate change here in this region, in our climate, are huge. We are uh, uh, recognized as a hotspot. You know, the 1.5 degrees the entire world is trying to prevent by 2050. We already reached that a few years ago. We are in a dry, uh, hot climate uh, along the sea. Um, and we will be widely affected from floods, fires, uh, the rise of the sea level, um, our national security. We are uh, uh, we have a, um, a, a land uh, connection to Africa, to Asia. Um, we are in in a very uh, vulnerable uh, hotspot, uh, both regarding our national security and also uh, the the nature. Uh, here in the climate areas and, um, and uh, the ecosystems that is so vital uh, for the, for now we know for the, for the mere you know, existence and survival of humankind, uh, no less than that. So we have a, a, an even bigger responsibility than other countries to adjust and to prepare to the climate disasters and to the climate change that lies ahead in the, in the next few years and that is already happening. You know, in the past, we thought that this is something uh, of the future that we will leave our children or grandchildren. Now we know that uh, it is already happening and the IPCC report from, uh, from this summer showed it very, very clearly. Um, and third, and that is maybe <clears throat> very, uh, um, uh, relate, something that, that most people know about Israel, uh, know, know Israel as a startup nation, Israel has its innovation and technology in fields of not only energy and climate, but also food tech, which is highly connected to uh, climate and uh, many other uh, um, innovation and technology sectors that Israel can contribute to the world um and uh, and have a much bigger effect than just on reducing the emissions within our borders and this is something that uh, i keep telling my colleagues in the in the government and the prime minister that is very invested and you know prime minister bennett has a background in uh, high tech and, uh, and startup uh, uh, industry and i keep telling them you know um we are developing innovation and technology but we cannot only export it outside. We have to also implement what we, the, the knowledge and the innovation that we have to share and we want to, uh, we want to spread. We have to implement it, first of all, uh, at home. Um, so these are three reasons why Israel is in, in a very, uh, uh, in a very, on a focus, in, in a very uh, good position. Um, on the verge of uh, of the climate uh, of the climate change and then the climate change discourse uh, uh, globally, um, and I think that many of the philanthropy activity that is already happening, and I know there is there is a huge interest in climate and environment right now, is also very much uh, um, it's very implemented into fields that are already uh, in action in philanthropy because the world is now speaking about uh, just tran transition. How do we make this tran transition to a low or zero carbon uh, economies and societies with, with uh, leaving no one behind, with uh, taking care of minorities? Um, for example, for us in the, uh, in the Ministry of Environmental Protection, we are about to launch a very, very big uh, program uh, to address the um, to address the, the Arab society um, waste uh, management and uh, climate change uh, uh, adaptation um, with with a special regard to minorities and how the uh, we make sure that no one is more affected and especially the weaker. Uh, um, communities and, uh, and, and citizens and people, men and women, um, that will not be over affected by uh, climate change uh, um, 
situation and, and especially disasters. <clears throat> so um, this is in the very uh, heart of everything we do in, in, the, in the philanthropy. And I think that I hear that from many, many places that uh, this is a booming uh, issue and a booming uh, subject right now. Many are interested in, and I think the, the civil society and, and philanthropy um, in Israel uh, must take the next step um, into uh, um, how, how does the, the, new, the new world of climate change uh, meets us in everything we do and how it is implemented into our already, uh, what we are doing in policy, in philanthropy, in business, in, in the economy, um, in social change, and uh, basically everything, because we are entering a new world. And uh, if we don't lead, uh, we will be left behind, and we don't want that. Thank you, Tamar. So first of all, I'm, I'm reminding everyone, if you have questions, please post them in the chat, and we'll bring them up to Tamar. Um, I'd like to start with one question, and that's towards the Glasgow Accords and the summit. What are the next steps for the government, and what what is your vision really? What are the what are your next steps as minister, and what are you hoping to achieve in your tenure as the minister? Okay, so um, no no question that the Glasgow COP twenty six is is a benchmark, in, uh, and it uh, tackles us in the beginning of the of our term because we're. Just recently, we, we uh, uh, marked uh, 100 days for this government, and you know the 100 days, it, I think it's a Kennedy expression that the first 100 days is like a, a test on the one hand to what you, you will do or will not do in the rest of your uh, term, but it's also some kind of a trial and you know you should be uh, uh, treated with forgiveness uh, during those first uh, 100 days. So we had a very, very busy 100 days, we were managed to uh, uh, to design the new uh, the new uh, nation uh, budget uh, after three years that uh, it was not uh, passed um, and uh, we in on climate actually we have a very very intensive uh, work we had a, a new and updated um, government decision with our targets for a reduction of emissions and also our, our adaptation program um, we, uh, we introduced for the first time in Israel carbon tax, which is a proven uh, mechanism to, uh, to uh, reduce emissions that we see it in almost any other country. I think almost all uh, countries of the OECD already have some kind of carbon pricing. Um, we have plastic tax on the, uh, um, and, you know, the, the plastic uh, utilities like plates, cups, um, straws, uh, all, the, all those uh, uh, tools. And uh, we are actually on these very days are working on uh, to, to present our uh, um, thorough uh, implementation plan. How do we as a government with uh, 14 different ministries implement uh, our targets and make them a working plan for the entire government for the next term. And that includes, of course, the Ministry of Environment, but also, of course, energy, transportation, agriculture, uh, welfare, because we have to prepare with, especially with vulnerable uh, populations and etc. cetera. Um, so um, we, we are working to come to Glasgow with effective and proven uh, steps that we can present and we can actually put Israel in one line with the most developed uh, countries in the place where we believe we are, uh, you know, we are, this is our place. Um, and so uh, my, my goal is to put the climate change uh, uh, discourse and activity um, on, on the top of the order of priorities for, for the national uh, agenda. And that even after you take into consideration, you know, Iran and, uh, and uh, Hamas and all the threats that we have, and we do have them and social gaps and et cetera. But I truly believe that climate is the challenge of, the, of our generation and maybe a challenge that mankind in, in history have never met such a, such a challenge that actually affects you know, our lives 
360 degrees, you know, surround us. Um, so um, I think that Israel should be there and can be there. And uh, we are taking, I know we are kind of uh, maybe a little bit late relative to, uh, to others, especially in Europe, but uh, um, we are getting there. We will get there. This is our challenge. Amen. We have a few questions here. One is, um, what is the ministry doing to stop approval of the Katza Emirates company agreement? Okay, so first of all, I have to make it very, very clear that this is not an Emirate uh, agreement. This is a commercial agreement between Katza, which is an Israeli uh, company, and a partnership, a, a business, a corporate uh, uh, organization that has nothing to do, and we have made it very clear, and also our uh, officials from the Emirates, and I visited the Emirates just a few, two weeks ago, um, and spoke to Emirati officials. Um, I, I think that both Israel and the uh, and, uh, Emirati officials see eye to eye that this is uh, a commercial agreement that is detached from the political agreement from the Abraham Accord and for the very strong and good relationship that both countries are committed to. As a matter of fact, I signed the MOU uh, with my Emirati uh, minister, woman minister, by the way, um, in, to, to celebrate and to decide on cooperations on environment, on adaptation in arid areas, on uh, developing of uh, renewable energies, uh, and not on, uh, it, it has not a single word in it on fossil fuels or any, any, anything of that kind. So uh, we believe as ministry and we don't hide it. I'm actually very uh, loud about it, very vocal about it, that uh, this agreement has uh, poses uh, tremendous uh, environmental risks, risks that we cannot take uh, in, on behalf of the Gulf of Elat that has a world unique uh, coral reef in the Red Sea. Um, and uh, actually we are now under very, very uh, um, intensive uh, talks within the government. So this is under policy review in the government. And uh, we, uh, as the Ministry of Environment, uh, put our very clear, uh, uh, um, our very clear position. Um, and um, it's not over yet, but uh, it's in progress. Now I was now you're muted. muted. Yeah, now I'm <laughs> muted. I have a follow-up question that someone posed exactly along the same lines. What is still missing in the government policies and actions? And what are the conflicts in the government? On climate as a whole. On climate as a whole. Yes. We don't have uh, the whole night, but uh, on climate. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, on climate. So um, I, I think that uh, we are still missing legislation and we are working on a climate law that will put the uh, the legal framework for our commitments on climate. Um, we are working on working on that. And another thing that I think is missing is a declaration on a climate uh, emergency that many countries have declared, uh, including Biden in uh, in a presidential uh, order. And um, we I wrote to Prime Minister Bennett in July after the climate disasters that we saw worldwide um, suggesting that we have to do so and we actually have very intensive work with all arms of the government prime minister's office and all the other ministries to promote these two uh, um, these two items um, and to uh, to push them forward in the next few months or a year or something like that great thank you another i think it's the last question do you have any tax incentives for investors to invest in clean energy and impact investings that affect climate? Okay, so that is a very good question. I think, as I mentioned before, this is uh, something that we um, we got from from something Prime Minister Bennett is very very passionate about: um, innovation, green technology, green energy, food tech. And I I, I stress food tech because I know that. Um, Many people don't make the connection between food tech and climate, but actually it is one of the most uh, important and uh, uh, clean industries and in which Israel is a world leader and is very uh, um, uh, known for. 
Um, so we are now working on several uh, uh, different um, um, areas to, uh, to work on uh, um, helping and pushing and encouraging uh, and promoting the Israeli clean tech, uh, energy tech, food tech, waste tech, um, uh, uh, recycling tech, uh, all, all, all feeds of, of environment and climate um, to make, and I mean, really the sky is the limit on that. So, I mean, we are working on uh, several ideas. Some of them will probably um, be um, recruiting uh, investments and, uh, and tax. And I mean, I I, I'm not sure I can, uh, give all the specifics right now, but um, Israel will, will push forward very, very strongly on that uh, very soon. And I think this is something really worth, you know, following on. And uh, we took it and, uh, you know, everybody, prime minister's office, and really it's, it's very, very like this next week, we'll have a reception and the president's Her president Herzog's uh, residence. Uh, to celebrate the, uh, the delegation to Glasgow and we'll have some startups presenting there and this is something really on the focus of our uh, of our uh, activity um, and uh, I think we also I don't want to uh, neglect uh, some of the philanthropy that is not uh, you know business uh, oriented that we are also developing. I mentioned uh, the Arab uh, community and the Arab minority, but we also have many other uh, fields in, in case of, uh, in, in uh, terms of uh, nature-based solutions in the, um, you know, nature conservation is a huge part of climate adaptation, especially in Israel being so small and with so, uh, such a dense uh, uh, spaces and uh, protecting our open spaces and uh, preserving our nature, our biodiversity is a huge uh, thing for us. And this is something that as Ministry of uh, Environmental Protection, we will really like to uh, look into more closely and to have uh, um, more uh, rich cooperation with, with uh, philanthropy bodies. So this is also something to take into consideration. Thank you. You mentioned the president, and I think I heard a rumor that his wife, who is also used to be a member of the philanthropic community, she led a foundation for many, many years until recently, um, that one of the issues that she's hoping to promote is environment within the president's house. So we're definitely going to reach out to her as the philanthropic community or the Green Funders Forum to see how we can collaborate with her. But maybe oh, there's uh, maybe the final thing or the words you want to leave us with if there is a message that you have for us, the philanthropic community that cares about the issue, both in Israel and the U.S. or around the world, what do you think Tzav Sha'ai is? What is it in this moment of time that you think we need to be doing or looking at hand in hand with the government? Yes, I think it's just really to get involved in that. I think we are in Israel, uh, it's booming. It's relatively new. I think if you look at the world, I, I mean, um, some countries are ahead of us, but um, but I think the summer of uh, 2021 was kind of a turning point in terms of realizing how critical, how urgent, how severe the climate crisis is and how Israel is affected from and, and basically, you know, to, to adjust to the new world, we'll have to change. And we'll have to change the way we, we consume and the way we, uh, we produce and the way we, we travel and the way we interact with each other. Um, and I think Israelis are, you know, they look at it and they, they ask themselves what's going to happen. And I think this is where the government, the, the private sector in, in, uh, in the economy, but also philanthropy enters to see how we make this transition just, how we make it right, how we lead instead of, you know, being dragged. Um, and uh, I think this is something that the phil philanthropic uh, community must, you know, take, must, must take a lead in it because this is what philanthropy does. It takes, it identifies what is not yet be become a reality for, for policymakers and, and make it a reality. So we are here and we'd love to uh, cooperate on anything. 
Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Marla, I'm handing sure. it back to you. Mr. Zamberg, before you leave, we are so grateful that you came and spoke to us and just grateful for every word. And I want you to know I live a 15 minute walk from the Knesset. So just call and oh. I'm not only a philanthropist and an impact investor, I like to show up as an activist. So great. I, I will be there. Um, great. Thank you. So thank you very much. And also thank you to a, minister, a member of Knesset, Alon Tal, who um, had to leave the call earlier. This is really only the beginning of the conversation. We, we got to cover a lot of topics. I think it was fantastic that Minister Zamberg mentioned so many different aspects, but we hope we will delve into some of those in greater depth in the future sessions. So this is just the first of the five sessions. Uh, again, the next session is November 16th. I hope you can all join us. I hope you can join us for all the sessions, but again, feel free. If you can't come to all, just come to what you can. Um, and we, we really want to be the resource for you. Again, I became active in the, Green, in the Green Funders Forum because I really wanted to expand this conversation and help move people to action on what is considered to be a wicked problem. It's so overwhelming, it's hard to know where to jump in. But we wanna help identify those game changers for you and to help you understand where your philanthropy can make a difference. Whether it's because you have a major giving category that is the environment or whether you just, you wanna jump in because you wanna make a difference with part of your grant making or with the intersection with your other issue areas. So please um, let us know what you thought about this session, if you have thoughts for future sessions. And again, to tell you that we are offering free consultation uh, meetings with both Seagal and Gil to help move you to action with this very overwhelming topic. Thank you so much for coming. And thanks again to Seagal and Gil for all of your amazing management of the, of the Green Funders Forum. I hope you enjoyed it. See you at the next sessions and we'll be Thank sending you. out the recording. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Chat, you can already register for the next session or just feel free to email Seagal or I directly.